Howdy, folks. Welcome to my presentation. I'm going to be talking today about how to work with lawyers before your first legal hire. Start off a little bit about me. I'm currently at Fenwick. Um, previously, was trained as a traditional securities litigator uh, for another big law firm. And then I was in-house at Ripple for a little over a year working on their litigation against the SEC. My current position, I represent companies across the industry, um, exclusively in crypto, doing everything from supporting token launches to de-risking communications and community relations to representing folks in SEC investigations and litigation and um, all sorts of other craziness that comes up in our industry. Um, I'm currently also working on a product, um, a structure that provides DNO insurance to token holders who participate in governance. I am a lawyer, so I have to give you a caveat, which is that this is not legal advice. Um, there may be people out here from projects where I actually am your lawyer, but as we'll talk about later, I would never give you legal advice in this public setting because that would destroy privilege. Um, I also should note that I'm a US attorney. I'm talking about US legal issues. Um, obviously, there's a lot of cross-border um, issues in our industry, and I'm not necessarily going to touch on those. All right. Why you should listen to me, why those of you in the audience right now are watching on video are the smartest people at East Denver. Uh, we're building in an industry that is rife with regulatory uncertainty and litigation risk. I mean, obviously, if any lawyer is going to get up here in any industry and tell you that legal is the most important thing and everyone should pay attention to what we have to say. Um, but honestly, it's even more critical for builders and, and folks in crypto. But most companies in this space, or most projects, aren't going to have a lawyer on staff until very late stages. And so at the beginning, when you're first starting to build, it's going to be developers supervising outside counsel, right? And so well, the point of my presentation today is to talk a little bit about what that looks like and what you should be doing if you're in that position. Um, or another way to think about it would be like, what are things that I wish my clients knew before they came to Fenwick and hired me, right? To avoid issues that we have to fix later. So the first question we're gonna talk about, if I can, there we go, oops, is when to hire a lawyer. Um, Again, to be self-serving, I'm going to tell you as soon as possible, get lawyers involved. Um, but actually, honestly, that's kind of true. The less building that you do without legal review, the fewer problems that we're going to have that we have to fix or undo later. Um, I have to say that. Certainly, of course, anytime you're doing any type of fundraising or token launch or SAF or something like that, you're going to want legal to take a look. That's, that's an area where there's um, kind of a clear inflection point in this industry. Um, but also, frankly, you know, any lawyer in this space should be willing to talk to you about like, where you're at right now. Is this the time to bring in lawyers? What might that look like later? And, and they shouldn't charge you for that. So you know, certainly my team at Fenwick is always willing to have those conversations, and most lawyers in this space will do that. Um, so you should be thinking early and often about where's, when is the right time to bring in a legal team to look at what you're doing. Um, and, you know, and again, like, there, there are ways to do that that are cost effective and, and to, to make sure that there's planning for that. So then the next thing I want to talk about is like, what do lawyers do in this space? Um, and sorry, I just have like random memes up here because I was putting this together on a red eye last night, so enjoy. Uh, you'll be bringing in lawyers, of course, to flag legal risk and help you figure out how to mitigate it, right? But it's a little bit bigger than that. Like a good lawyer, particularly in this space, is going to be a builder too, right? Like we're going to help you note business risks and benefits of proposed courses of action and, and really be a partner in what you're trying to put together. One thing I really do want to communicate, though, is that lawyers are not going to be making decisions for you, right? So sometimes clients come in and they're like at a moment of inflection and the considerations are really difficult. And, you know, they're looking at somebody who's got like years of experience in the industry and, and working outside. And they're like, hey, maybe this person can like just figure this out for me. And that's not like what lawyers are going to do, at least not good ones. Right? Like what we're going to do is make recommendations to you. We'll explain the considerations. We'll give you the pros and cons, both from a business and a risk perspective. But we're not going to tell you what to do. We're going to say it depends. We're going to say, here's some options. We're going to say, here's our recommendation. And we're not doing that to be annoying. We're doing that because at the end of the day, like we have a different role, right? And the risk belongs, and, and, and the rewards and the you know, decision point belongs to the business and doesn't belong to us. Um, that said, if you come to a lawyer with a plan and they say, do not do that, and especially if they say, do not do that in writing, you should take that very seriously. Right? Um, because lawyers are generally loath to tell people what to do and what not to do. So when we do that, um, it's generally going to be something that is you know, truly, truly a problem. What are the types of issues that a lawyer in this space should be flagging for you? 
course, given my background as a securities litigator and SEC troll, I'm going to tell you that you, they should be looking at securities risk and SEC exposure. But there's a lot of other stuff too, right? There's your tax strategy, there's money transmission and banking laws, there's intellectual property, there's um, sanctions and OFAC, there could be gambling, there may be others depending on your project. Right? I, I can't give you an exhaustive list here, but the point that I wanted to make here and why I d d dedicated an entire slide to this is like, don't get shortchanged. Like, make sure that whoever you're working for is at least conversant in these issues and how they inter intersect in our space so they can tell you when. Like, even if you just hire someone to do your trademark or something like that that doesn't seem necessarily like a Web3 issue, they're gonna be learning a lot about your business. And you want that person to be able to tell you like, this is outside my expertise, but it's putting kind of flags off in my brain. Let me recommend somebody else to you that might need to look at this, right? Because that's part of what you're looking for too. Like you're building, 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 moving quickly, you've got a lot going on. You need your legal partner to be somebody who can help you figure out when you need more help, help you figure out when you're tripping into a red area, help you avoid that quicksand. Do you need crypto native counsel? <laughs> it depends. I told you that was lawyer's favorite thing to say. If you're looking for advice on an issue that you can explain fully without using any jargon, you're probably okay with a lawyer who's an expert in that field and may not necessarily be an expert in crypto. So a good example of this might be trademark, right? If you're trademarking something, it kind of doesn't matter what you're using the trademark for. Like that's going to be pretty much the same across the you know, industry. And you want to find somebody who's good at trademark and not necessarily somebody who's good at crypto. But if you're looking for advice on a fundamental decision for your business, right? If you're, looking, if you're asking questions that require an understanding of what you're building and how it works and how the industry functions, Make sure you get a lawyer who understands what you're building, how it works, and how the industry functions, right? Because there's a lot of lawyers out there who, hold, who have had like one crypto client and they hold themselves out as like, I'm now an expert, I'm a Web3 lawyer, this is how I'm marketing myself. And when you dig below the surface, you realize that they don't, you're not speaking the same language, right? And they're not really understanding what you're asking for here. And so they can't do that important work of flagging issues for you and making sure that you're not taking on more risk than you want to. All right. How do you find a crypto native lawyer? This next slide is not really a gift, but it's a shout out to uh, Microsoft Teams, which has these like lawyer sharks that I'm low key obsessed with. Um, how do you find a crypto native lawyer? Come to Fenwick, just kidding. Um, when I was in house at Ripple, there were a few things that I would ask lawyers to determine whether or not they were someone who might be a good fit for a project that required a deeper understanding of what we were building and what we were doing. One question was just like, how do you keep up with the industry? Right? I think we all know what the correct answers are, um, mostly Twitter. Uh, but a lot of lawyers will come back and they'll be like, well, I do CLEs and I go to presentations and I read publications. And you're like, what, what are we talking about here, right? Because if they're, look, if they're learning about the industry from content that's created by non-crypto native lawyers for other non-crypto native lawyers, they're not gonna have the depth of understanding that you want. You should also dig in on a lawyer's experience. What types of projects have you represented before? Like lawyers can't always name our clients, right? So they may not be able to give you that list, although they should be able to give you some kind of references or referrals. But they can tell you, like, I've represented layer ones, I've represented layer twos, I've represented token projects, I've represented, you know, folks in the ZK space. Like whatever the thing is that you're working on, they should be able to tell you if they've worked on that before. I would also ask people, like, do you hold tokens? <laughs> Which ones? Where do you put them? Do you self-custody? I'm just trying to get a feel for, like, whether there's someone who's truly, like, invested in the space and invested in the industry, or if this is just a new hot topic that they're looking to, like, make a name in or make a quick buck in or, like, kind of, like, they're going to do this for now. If all else fails, if you're evaluating um, whether to hire a lawyer and you're trying to figure out whether there's somebody who has the expertise you need, you can just start talking and see how glazed over their eyes get, right? So start explaining to them like how your product works, what you're trying to do, like how things work in your industry, like in your particular segment of it, and then just see what questions they ask. And it's pretty easy to tell when you're talking about something very technical, if someone's tracking to the point you need them to, or if they're just completely lost and like using buzzwords. And like to be clear, like you're not gonna find crypto native counsel who understand what you're doing as well as you do. Like that's not the goal and that's not gonna be possible. But you want somebody who can like, with a little bit of digging and with a little bit of time maybe, like actually understand how the pieces fit together and how this works. 
I don't know how anybody could ever do that if they're not themselves participants in the industry, right? Which is why I ask, I would always ask the question like, what tokens do you hold? Where do you hold them? Like what, what kind of, what is your exposure to crypto and how do you use it? Um, but maybe I'm wrong. Like maybe there are people out there who like deeply understand the industry without ever doing those things, right? Like I, I guess it's possible. All right, we're halfway through. We're gonna stay on the next slide for a while because this is the bulk, the most important part of the presentation. So if you were sleeping or on your phone, now is the time to listen. We're gonna talk about attorney-client privilege. This is the number one thing that I wish that my clients understood and that I wish that they understood before they hired counsel, right? And when they're working on these kind of like one-off projects at the beginning before they have kind of a comprehensive relationship with a law firm that's really like shepherding through their business. Because this is an area where you can do a lot of good work and a lot of mitigating risk if you understand what you're doing. Attorney-client privilege protects confidential communications between an attorney and a client for the purpose of giving or receiving legal advice. The privilege exists primarily so that people can ask their lawyers for advice without worrying that that will be used against them later, right? So there's all, like, you know, particularly in the US legal system, there's a lot of disclosure. Most of what you say is eventually gonna come out in public or at least in the you know, public in the context of a litigation. But the conversations with your lawyer are special and they're unique because you want people to be able to come to you and say like, hey, I'm thinking about you know, selling crypto in Iran. Is that a good idea? And then I can say, no, do not, fuck with, do not mess with sanctions. I don't know if I'm allowed to curse on stage. Uh, and that's the purpose of the privilege, right? It's to make sure that you can really have those open and honest conversations with your lawyers and get the advice that you need. A necessary ingredient to protecting the privilege is a lawyer, right? So one consideration, we talked about earlier when to hire legal counsel, one consideration might be if you find yourself making decisions that you're like, this feels like a legal decision, right? Or I'm getting some informal advice from lawyers or I'm looking things up online and I would really like this to be privileged and to be protected and to be in the context of that you know, protected relationship where I can really test the boundaries and ask the questions that I wanna ask without fear of reprisal or without fear of that coming back to be used against me later. The privilege will apply whether you use outside counsel or in-house counsel, as long as it's with a lawyer and for the purposes of legal advice. Why is this so important? Why am I spending probably half of my time talking about privilege? I'm gonna back up a little bit and talk to you about what happens when you get a regulatory notice of investigation or subpoena or when you get involved in litigation. It's not fun. All of your documents are gonna to have to be handed over, <laughs> pretty much, right? So when, I, when, I, when we get, one of my clients gets a letter from the SEC saying we're investigating, or you know, some private plaintiff says, hey, I'm about to bring this claim against you. The first thing that we have to do is protect all of the documents that exist that might be related to that potential litigation or regulatory action. Right? And then as the matter progresses, we actually have to start handing those over to the other side. Again, this is the US, other countries have a different practice. So what that looks like in practice is like we're going to Slack and we're pulling everything in Slack from an admin level. And then we're ingesting it into our legal systems at Fenwick, we're determining what's related to this litigation and that's going across, right? We're pulling everything from Google Drive, right? And those things are gonna go across if they're related to litigation. We're pulling people's phones, right? If you use Telegram, if you use Signal, if you use WhatsApp, if you use text messages, we're taking copies of, the, of your accounts on there and we're turning over those communications to the extent that they're related to the, to the litigation. And there's really not a lot that stops things from going across, right? Like this is the way we do litigation in the US. The whole idea is that like, you know, you want to, sunlight is the best disinfectant. We want to bring out all the facts so both parties understand what's going on. It's very noble. It's a very big pain when you're actually dealing with it in, in the real world. The main way that we stop things from going across is if they're privileged, right? So if you have conversations with your lawyer, right, that are privileged conversations, those are almost never gonna be turned over to the other side. They're almost never gonna be turned over to the government. So that's why this is such an important area to protect because you don't wanna be in a position where you've been building, 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 maybe getting some casual legal advice, you've got a lawyer who doesn't really understand how privilege works in this context, and then you get, you know, a year later, you've got an SEC inquiry, and all of those conversations that you would have wanted to be protected or maybe even thought were protected, are going over to the SEC so they can see exactly what you were considering and use that against you and can I make it look like you were trying to do something that was, you know, illegal or wrong. I don't have time today to go over all of my key points about how to protect privilege, but I'm gonna give you a couple of practical tips. Um, yeah, I'm talking about privilege for a long time. Um, one really important thing to note is that as the client, you can break privilege by introducing parties who are not part of the attorney-client relationship to the conversation. 
right? So if you forward emails from your attorney to a friend or another founder or an investor or your girlfriend or whatever, like that can break privilege. So you want to be really careful about emails from your lawyers and keeping them within the safe space. As projects decentralize, this gets really, really complicated, right? Because if you have a project that starts off maybe as, you know, kind of a more centralized project that's coming from a, you know, development team here in the United States, but then as we get closer to token launch or some other event, we start to spin out other entities or other people become involved, and now there's an overseas foundation, and now there's some development companies in Europe, and there's all of these other things going on. Employees are moving around among these entities. People who used to be part of the privilege aren't part of the privilege anymore, depending on the stage of decentralization you're at. Right? And I think this is something that where it really becomes important to have a lawyer who understands the industry, because that's so different than in a normal Web2, you know, or even just like regular company context, where it's so easy to tell, you, know, you work for the company, you're in the privilege, you don't work for the company, you're not in the privilege. Like, that's not the world that we're operating in. Third point. Only communications that relate to giving or receiving legal advice are privileged. Copying your lawyer on everything will not make it privileged. Copying your lawyer on everything will not make it privileged. People get confused about that. Fourth practical tip. Start new threads for things that you want to keep privileged. So that applies to email, that applies to Slack, that applies to Telegram, whatever. Start a whole new conversation when you're talking about something that you want to keep privileged. It makes it a lot easier when you get to the point of trying to withhold things and not hand them over because you claim that they're privileged if the, if the conversation is limited to this one privileged topic and there's not a lot of interspersed other things going on. Fifth tip. Questions about privilege are privileged, right? So if you find this confusing when you're starting to work with an attorney, like this should be an area that you really explore and that you should talk to your attorney about and say, okay, like at this stage, what's privileged? Who's in the privilege? Who's out? As we decentralize what's privileged, who's in the privilege? Who's out? And keep this on your mind. And if you don't have a lawyer who's flagging these issues and who's like helping you manage where documents are going and who has access to them so that we can maintain privilege over them, your lawyer is not doing their job. Right? I think that's an area, again, like, that is so important in our space that's so different from the way kind of traditional companies are built. Oh my gosh, did I finish with some time left? For the first time ever, an attorney is going to stop before her time is up because I've covered the things that I wanted to prepare today. Thank you guys so much for your time and attention. If you have any follow-up, you can find me on all the social medias. My handle's at Reba Matsumura, or you can just look for Rebecca Matsumura at Fenwick. Have a great rest of the time at ETH Denver. Bye, y'all.